this is Miss Lipton, and this is Seventh Period Review. Say hi. Hi. All right. So this is step re big uh, big idea review, and this is our second time we've met together. We are still on. I just want to remind those who have uh, not been with us before um, that we have four big ideas, and within those big ideas, there are enduring understandings. Within those enduring understandings, there are 55 essential knowledge. And remember that it's the essential knowledge, these 55, plus your science practices combined together make up the learning objective. And in the notes, I have sometimes cut and pasted the learning objectives in for you in the shared parts of the no notes, um, or I have identified them by number. You have a list of all the learning objectives there are. I, you've had it since the very first day of school in August. You have this same document right here. If you look at the whole thing, I'm just gonna re-remind you one more time. Is this frozen? No. Um, one more time, you have this document and you've had it since August 9th or 7th, whenever we first met. Hello. And you kind of skip down into this page right here and it lists you know, um, each of the big ideas, the essential understandings, the essential knowledge underneath each one of those. And that is what I've been referencing all along in our notes as well. So I just want to remind you to, to look at that. I want to remind you to look at your science practices. These are your science practices. Be ready to write or reflect on any of those, especially during the writing protocol. And you've taken a couple practice tests with me by now. You can see how they reference them in your questions, you can see how a lot of the stuff you've memorized, they actually incorporate into the question, but hopefully that facilitates you moving rapidly through that question because you have a greater understanding of it. So, we finished Enduring Understanding 1A and Enduring Understanding 1B last time. So I'm gonna mosey on down to slide 67, and we are on Enduring Understanding 1C. If you weren't here last time or you didn't have a chance to listen to the video, what I recommended is you keep a document of the stuff you think, oh my gosh, you talked about that, I forgot about it, I better review that. Don't try to type everything I say. Um, there's nothing wonderful, if, I mean, there's a little wonder about it, but <laughs> um, I would just try to keep track of what you needed to review. So um, going back to big idea one, big idea one is all about the idea of what? Remember? Evolution, yeah, big idea one is all about evolution. And 1C is life continues to evolve within a changing environment. Life continues to evolve, meaning it's not static, right? And, and why is this changing environment? I mean, do you have to have a changing environment to evolve? What would be another way to evolve? Just through what process? Mutations, right? Mutations could cause you to evolve. But a changing environment could cause you to, to evolve, why? To adapt, right? Because there are some organisms that are more fit for that particular environment and are more likely to survive and reproduce. Now, I asked you that, and there was a lot of blank, but some of you got it. But I'm going to tell you, those are some of the open ended questions they ask you is like, think, okay, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, change in environment changes what makes you fit, right? Which, which traits are most adaptive. So, reviewing again the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is within the species, macroevolution is to a new species. What do we call those steps in between where you're not one or the other necessarily? Transitional fossils. And are there examples we talked about last time of transitional yeah. fossils? Yes, there are. Okay, um, Okay. the origin of species. So speciation is the formation of new species, one changing into another. And there are different paces of speciation. There's gradualism. I don't think I have it on this slide, but I'm going to just talk about it. Gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. Gradualism, what word do you hear in that? Gradual, it's a slow accumulation of um, changes. Punctuated equilibrium, I think punk, punctuated, I think punch, and that's a quick change. And by quick in geologic time scale, we're talking like a million years, is very quick. Um, and so which one would you have more transitional fossils? Gradualism or punctuated equilibrium? Gradualism. Right, you're so smart. Um, so what is a species? We talked about this quite a bit in class, that it's really hard to say this is a species, you know, at this point they formed a new species. 
there's the issue of interbreeding. And some organisms just won't interbreed because they don't live what? Close, Close together. So they don't, you don't know because if you grab them and put them in a lab, you don't know if they do that because they're lonely or because they're really interested in reproducing and making viable offspring, right? Because there's some behavioral things that might change in a lab condition that wouldn't happen out in nature. But the big thing about a species is that they share a common gene pool. Now, and that they can interbreed. But if you're asexual, that's a hard definition to use, right? If you're asexual. Um, so there are some that the overlap of some species where they're high, hard to distinguish. Um, so originally, and if you're looking at fossils, you're gonna look at morphology. You know, what are the what are the structures that differentiate between the different species? Today we have um, technology so we can compare DNA sequences and DNA hybridization in order to compare are we a sim more similar species. Um, and that's good on that. Um, let's look at these different types of species. And if we remember, we looked at there was like 16 or 17 different definitions. Um, why don't you just ping pong back and forth on those with somebody who's close to you. Go ahead. Okay, so let's talk about the first one, the biological definition, which is reproductive isolation. So um, when we talked about reproductive isolating mechanism, any structure functional, structural, functional, what you do with your structure, behavioral characteristic that prevents successful mating. So you can have all the right parts to fit together, but if you don't know the signals that you would need to do before you mate, or you like to mate at three o'clock and other organisms like to mate at 12 o'clock, those are gonna be reproductive isolating mechanisms. Then those are broken into two categories, prezygotic and postzygotic. What would be more efficient, a pre or a postzygotic isolating mechanism? Pre. Prezygotic isolating me mechanisms, because then you're not wasting your sperm, egg, or time. All right, so we went through several of the um, prezygotic isolating mechanisms. Sperm does not meet egg. I'm going to go really fast through these slides because these should be a review. So why don't we just have one, you know, oldest person or person on the right? Um, why don't the person in the slate seat, you go first, and then we'll just ping pong back and forth yeah, with each one of these. So I'll do these here with you. So geographical isolation, we just don't live near each other, and that prevents interbreeding. There's some sort of barrier between us. Um, ecological isolation, we live in the same um, um, habitat, but we do not encounter each other within that habitat. Maybe you live at the top of the leaf and I live at the bottom of the leaf. Um, it could be, temporal would be that we just breed at different times, um, let's say at different seasons of when we want to breed. Okay, I'm switching next slide, here we go, keep ping ponging. Um, behavioral isolation means we're not able to signal to one another that we're ready um, um, in order to reproduce. Mechanical isolation, our parts don't fit together. Um, an example of that would be like claspers on a dragonfly. Um, it keeps um, reproductive isolating mechanism because that will only fit for their species to hold them into um, a, a place in, uh, so they're together for reproduction. Um, then moving on to guys right here. So now mechanical isolation, by the time we get to this point, we, if you get past this, you're actually doing something where your sperm and egg are coming near each other. On this one, you're just preventing the fusion, which means maybe on the cell, right, on the cell membrane, they don't have the right, what? Receptors. Postzygotic um, isolating mechanisms, maybe the hybrid um, has a spontaneous abortion, it doesn't develop all the way, or it's born and it's sterile, or it's born and it's not sterile, but the F2 offspring are sterile. All of those are isolating <coughs> mechanisms um, that keeps that keeps the speciation maintained, that they keep separate. 
if those are broken and they rejoin together and they can make viable offspring, then they're gonna fuse back into one species again. All right? Um, oh, so then I gave you some pictures. I'm just gonna go through those quickly because you know those. Um, we talked about that. Yay, review. Okay, so the most common form of speciation is allopatric speciation, which means you have some sort of what? Barrier. barrier. So you were together, but somehow a barrier is separating you. And um, then another way that you could have speciation is sympatric speciation, which I was right next to you and you changed. If you change that rapidly, it's probably due to your what? Chromosomes, probably chromosomes. So um, oldest bio buddy or uh, blue, why don't you differentiate between these two? Go ahead. So the one on the left is what kind of speciation? Allopatric and the one on the right? Sympatric, side by side sympatric. We're right there and it was probably a chromosomal change. Um, here is also showing you that allopatric speciation. Remember when you're separated, you're going to have different selection pressures. It may be a different mutational pressures, right, on you. Um, it could be due to your environment um, that is different. You have your initial gene frequency. Remember founder's effect, right? You have your different gene frequencies. And then um, whatever is best adapted, those are the ones that are going to survive and reproduce in that area. Um, a good example of allopatric speciation are the salamanders migrating from the northern to southern regions of California, and then right in the middle of it was a desert where they were not viable, so one went left, one went right, and they kept accu uh, accumulating changes along the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, on either side, what's this? Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. So pretty, you know, the Grand Canyon wasn't always as large as what it is today, but as a result of that, where they couldn't cross anymore, they started to accumulate differences so that on either side, um, even if a bridge is put over the Grand Canyon, they will not make because they've, um, they've developed so many intrinsic isolating mechanisms. Um, if they do get back together and they make viable offspring, then they will not be two different species. And I think that's pretty obvious. Um, example of sympatric um, speciation is on Lord Howe Island, and there are some palms, I believe. I can't remember because I didn't write it down anywhere, but these palms, and you can see right in the middle um, that they have been altered. Now, with plants, that is more likely to happen because they can take those fluctuations and they can have something like polyploidy, and they're okay. For you and I, we get one chromosome wrong, and we usually have some issues associated with that. So on this example, um, why don't we have, who are, do you know whose turn it is? Do you remember this slide? Can I yeah, give it to yeah. you? Okay, go for it. Work from left to right. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll just go really fast. I'm going to pause you just for a minute. Okay, thank you for being so patient with having it. We are at Tour Stops first one, so I got to do my biz. Okay, so here. Um, did you understand this? Yeah, of course. Okay. Why would I hope everybody else did. Too. <laughs> All right, so two different species, right? This would not be functional because you have to have homologous chromosomes unless those chromosomes underwent what? Mitosis, right? So you have two copies. Um, types of selection. Does directional selection um, support speciation? Yes, because you're going you're gonna to favor one of the extremes, yes? Um, does stabilizing selection favor speciation? No, because no, you're favoring the norm. You know, where it, it only usually works this size. You don't want to have a baby too big. You don't want to have a baby too little. You want your baby to be what? Disruptive. That's right. Um, disruptive speciation, does this favor speciation? Yes, because yes. yes. you're favoring both extremes. One is good for this. One is good for that. Um, speciation is at the boundary between microevolution and macroevolution. What a statement, but so true. So speciation is you're just making that transition. Um, what did I, oh, uh, this is basically the outcome of what happens. Usually you have some initial barrier, but then when that barrier is removed, 
you have these different options that can occur as a result. We've already reviewed those options. Um, hybrid zones. What does that mean? If you didn't even look at the description, hybrid zones, what would you think that was? Yeah, yeah. yeah where they're meeting, right? Okay. Um, next, oh, I really wanted to talk about this apparently. Um, there are three possible outcomes, strengthening of the reproductive barriers, which will maintain speciation, weakening of it, um, or continued formation of hybrids. If you have those hybrids, that has the potential actually of forming a third species, right? Because you could have the ones that diverged and then you could have these hybrids forming a third species. These are all your options. Um, sexual selection, we went over this. Intersexual and intra. Intra means anytime you see that, what? Within. Within. So these are males competing with other males to compete. Um, intersexual is male, female. Um, things like sexual dimorphism. Do you remember what that means? Yeah, yeah the females. Yeah, females and ma males look different. Um, and that would be um, um, this is not the one I wanted to show. There we go. Um, intersexual selection. That's where you see a differences between the male and the female. Who tends to be the prettiest one? Male. Males, right? Now, if they're all about the pretty, what hypothesis does that support? Run away no, hypothesis. <laughs> what is about the one bigger, stronger? That's good gene. Good gene hypothesis. So males competing with other males, they may, they may be competing on the prettiness scale, right? We saw the birds when they were trying to make their nests and put everything, or they might may be competing with the good gene hypothesis. Um, adaptive, yes? I was just thinking, wouldn't they kind of be the same thing? Because Yes, of, but go ahead. I want to hear what you have to say. Because, like, if... Um, only the stronger males are being selected for, wouldn't that make the females think that they are more attractive then? And well, I, that is why they're attractive to them, because they're stronger. So isn't it But okay. pretty runaway hypothesis has more to do with ornateness. Like for instance, yeah. who's the most, we, what do we think of as a really ornate bird? Peacock. Peacock. Peacock, right? To have those big feathers makes it harder for you to get away from your predators, right? It makes you brighter where your predator might see you. So you would think that is not helpful. But what it might show is I have these pretty colors means I'm really healthy because I have these pretty colors. I might be really strong and fast because even though I have all these pretty colors, I'm able to run away and nobody catches me. So you're right, they, in that way they overlap. But they're just saying sometimes, you know, not all species go for big ornate prettiness, right? So they're just saying, there are those, that competition, but that can still show you that they are in fact fit, right? Okay. okay. Um, adaptive radiation, another way, another form of speciation. Um, in this case, you're filling every single niche. Usually it's because they're vacant. That's what adaptive radiation is. Why are they vacant? It could be a new land form, or what else? What? Massive extinction of some sort. Yes. Sorry, last annoying question. But what's You're the not difference between um, adaptive radiation and then character displacement? Okay, so they will have character displacement while doing adaptive radiation. So for instance, you will like say, I'm gonna focus on the big seeds, you focus on the small seeds. They're filling every niche, that's adaptive radiation. How are they doing that? Because some have bigger beaks and some have smaller beaks. They're going away from the medium-sized beaks, so that's character displacement. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. And or you will have character displacement in order to do adaptive radiation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, yeah, okay. But another one to think about, like it could be because it doesn't mean there is an extinction necessarily of any of your species, but when dinosaurs went extinct, mammals who were small could now start coming out in the daytime. But that's adaptive. Yeah, but they're filling they're filling in that niche, but they didn't have that available to them before, but before somebody's gonna eat them. But now that those large carnivores are gone, now those mammals can come out and maybe even get larger. Um, adaptive radiation, Hawaiian honey creepers. There are even more honey creepers than there are when we talk about Darwin's finches. Um, when you talk about the honey creepers, because there's over 20 different ones, a stack of dead heads. Oh, and there's questions, but I'm gonna skip that for now because we wanted, I know, I know. But we have, I wanna get to this. We, we don't have that much left, and then we're done with this big idea. Stickleback, did you notice they were in a few exams, those sticklebacks? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. So sticklebacks keep coming up again and again, and it, they're easy to look at variations and to trace that to the chromosome. Some like will sneak up and, and sneak up and eat on the left side and steal um, 
the scales on them and eat them for some food. So then that number might increase until there's so many of them that they'll have to, they're more adaptive if they sneak up on the right side. So there's lots of behavioral things traced to this and chromosomes and um, how their environment changes. So there is a whole video on Bozeman just about sticklebacks um, and natural selection. I would watch that video on sticklebacks on your Bozeman. Yes. Okay, um, in during understanding 1D, the origin of living systems is explained by natural processes. So we can go bottoms up or top down, either deconstruct the life that we have, or we can talk about it from the bottom up, which we have talked about. And if you remember on the origin of life, right, we talked about how old um, the Earth is. We talked about how old the universe is. Do you remember how old the universe is? 13.5 13. 13. billion years. And we talk, let's just tell the story of early Earth, right? Um, the very first atmosphere was lost because there wasn't enough gravity to hang on to that first atmosphere. <coughs> the second atmosphere that actually came, came as an outgassing from what? Volcanoes. So you have the gases in the air. These are all inorganic, right? Inorganic gases. And then you have what falling down? Exactly. Rain. Okay, and so you have oxygen, but it's caught up as carbon monoxide or H2O. There is no free oxygen, so what kind of environment would that be? Reducing. reducing environment. That's critical that it's a reducing environment here in our primordial soup because, because a reducing environment is conducive to what? Building. To building molecules. Okay. Now, where do we have the energy in our primor primordial soup in order to do this building? Where is it going to come from? <laughs> Lightning. What else? Magma. Radiation. Radiation from the Earth's core, right? Molten magma. And so these gases right here and rain's coming down and those forms of energy allowed us to go from inorganic, mo inorganic molecules into our organic, organic molecules. Um, and who did an experiment on that? Oprah and hypo hypothesized it. Who actually did the experiment? Miller. Miller did the experiment. And within just a little over a week's time, um, using those inorganic molecules and circulating them through, I would assume I put a picture in here, but you never know. Yes, I did. Um, that he circulated them around, and then he was able to get those simple um, building blocks that we talked about. Let's go back to that stuff. There we go, right somewhere. Here, okay? So these inorganic molecules, where did these come from? Where did these molecules come from? Outgassing of volcanoes. Outgassing. Remember we, we just said it. I know you're tired, but dig in, okay? So outgassing of volcanoes, right? We have energy, lightning, radiation, molten magma, UV radiation that allowed organic molecules to be made. This was recreated within a lab with just a little over a week, okay? Then we could take these sugars and amino acids and fatty acids and build our polymers. Who are important polymers? Yes. Proteins, carbs, nucleic acids, lipids, right? What are the two categories of lipids? Steroids. Fats and steroids, right? Now, we have the same energy going on again to synthesize these, or it could be evaporation out of puddles. Do you remember that part? Evaporation out of puddles where they're more condensed. Clay can act as a reactant. Um, I'm sorry, clay can act as a catalyst. Um, and to facilitate those reactions. Um, then once you have these proteins, carbs, lipids, you need some early cell, and it's gonna start by creating a barrier. And we know that our barriers are called a what? Phospholipid bilayer. So it has lipids and what's embedded in there because it's called the fluid mosaic model. Proteins. proteins, right? And if you take hot proteins and cool them, they will form these protonoid microspheres. Remember Fox, protonoid microspheres? or Oprah's coacervate droplets. So either droplets of fat or droplets of proteins. The real thing is a protein and a fat, so maybe some combination of those two give you your early cell. Do you think that early cell was a prokaryotic or eukaryotic okay. cell? Okay. Yes, and for it to be a true cell, it had to be have some sort of genetic code and was self-replicating. When we talked about what that genetic code would be, we said it was probably what? RNA, probably RNA.
because RNA can be a storage for information and it can also act as a catalyst, right? Remember we talked about an example of that would be ribozymes. So just monomer evolution, when you look at monomer evolution, that's taking the early, the early gases on Earth, the energy, maybe it came from an asteroid, we talked about hydrothermal vents, and forming your monomers. Miller did that experiment and he formed those monomers. Um, next, when we talk about um, polymer evolution, what came first? And we would know the key ones we need are proteins and we need nucleic acids, right? Because nucleic acids is what, gonna, is what is gonna carry the information and proteins act as catalysts, right? Enzymes in our reaction. So these are critical to build. And we said what came first? Remember we talked about that it could have happened at the same time on the surfaces of clay. Looks like maybe that's something you need to review just a little bit. These are the protonoid uh, microspheres that Fox showed. Um, Karen Smith, not really a female, said that clay could act at a as a catalyst and could have facilitated the building of both of them. Um, most scientists think that RNA came first and later DNA evolved as a storage form because it's double-stranded to store the genetic code and protect it. Um, your first cell, uh, probably an autotroph or a heterotroph? Heterotroph. What? Heterotroph. Heterotroph, because it's easier to be a heterotroph than a autotroph for sure. Okay, look, we're almost done. Um, then you needed to have a form of energy. What, what, who does it? Who, what is it? Oh, who does it? Oh, Which, who, what do they do though? Cellular. 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 Cellular respiration, but what's the first step? Glycolysis. And who does that? All, All cells. cells. There we go. Glycolysis is universal. If you do not have any oxygen, you're going to follow glycolysis up with fermentation. Why do you even need to do a fermentation? Because you need to reform what? NAD. You need to oxidize NAD because in this process of glycolysis, as you recall, and we'll hit this in other big ideas when we talk about energy, you're going to be reducing the NAD. You need to oxidize it again so you can reuse it. Okay, um, central dogma, we know this. DNA to DNA is replication. DNA to RNA is transcription. transcription. RNA to protein is translation. translation. Excellent. Formation of early Earth. Ooh, do you know these three things? Yes. Yes. So horizontal gene transfer. Um, horizontal means this way, right? Vertical would be to child. Do you see the difference between that? So you're going to do horizontal gene transfer when you take your plasmids and you transform your bacteria, right? They aren't forming children. You're giving them DNA on the horizontal. If a virus brings you DNA, what's that called? Transduction. Transduction, okay? If you exchange DNA like bacteria can do, when they do reproduction, they don't have to make any offspring, but when they do conjugation, they're just exchanging DNA but their offspring after that will have variation because of the DNA they've exchanged. Those are all examples of horizontal gene transfer. Okay, so that's a good one, that's a good slide. Um, I just talked about that. I think that's good. Okay, so close, I know we're close. Oh my gosh. Okay, um, fossils. Did we review fossils already? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I thought we did. So we reviewed it. So watch the first video. Um, absolute dating, relative dating. I don't think we reviewed that. Absolute dating is when you look at how fast an isotope breaks down, right? So if you know the rate of decay and you find a sample and you look to see what percentage of a certain isotope is in there based to what is the certain percentage that isotope is currently and you know how fast and how long, then you can tell how old that rock is. Do you remember how I would take like a piece of paper and I said, if this is the time it takes for half of it to break down, that's called a what? Half-life. That's two half-lives, three half-lives. You with me on that? Yeah. So if we expect a certain percentage of it and we find this, we go, oh my goodness, we only have this percentage. This is one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, four half-lives. Then we know how old this specimen is. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Are you just shaking your head because you want to be done? Both. Both? Yes. Okay. Um, when we look at the geologic time scale, most geologic time is spent where? Pre-Cambrian, right? 
And then it's not until we get multicellular fossils until if we're starting at last night at midnight, it would not be until 8 p.m. tonight that we even have multicellular fossils, right? And then you can see land plants are around 10 o'clock, dinosaurs at 11 o'clock, and humans don't evolve until the last 30 seconds. So we're relatively new here um, as far as the geologic time scale goes. Um, looking at stromatolites, we talked about that, I believe, already, and that's bacteria interacting with seawater and sand sticking to their slime. And just like you can cut down a tree, though I don't want you to, and you can look at the rings of the tree to see how old the tree is. When you look through these stromatolites, then you're looking at old bacteria um, dating back millions and millions of years. Um, Indosymbiotic hypothesis, we know that one. That is how a eukaryotic cell would have evolved from a prokaryotic cell. And who, which organelles do we think are free, were free living? And how do we, what's the evidence for that? They have their own DNA and it is circular. They are self-replicating. Their double membranes good and their ribosomes are the size of ribosomes you would expect in a prokaryotic cell. Okay. How come our mitochondria don't abandon our cells right now and say, I want to be my own cell? We've given over the control of the mitochondria to the nucleus, so they don't have that ability anymore. Um, <laughs> um, geologic time scale. Um, look, 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 we're almost there. Look, this is the end. Where is it? Oh, we're still, okay, let's, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Geologic time scale, if we look at this, we let's do this from now, 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 back, what era are we in right now? Cenozoic era. When did that end? 65 million years ago. What was the next era back? Mesozoic. Remember we did speed limit, you're driving now? Okay, then the next one is Mesozoic. When did that end? 245, 242, remember we said school's out? And after that, it's old and Paleozoic, and that goes back how many years? Yeah, there you go. Somewhere in the 500, late 500s, right? And then everything before that is Precambrian, right? By the end of the Precambrian era, we had early invertebrates, right? But in the Paleozoic, that's when you saw the biggest change. Um, you went from all the way um, from algae to early gymnosperms and you went from invertebrates to um, early reptiles, all within the Paleozoic era, okay? Then when you jump to the Mesozoic era, as far as animals go, that was the age of dinosaurs, and you went from early gymnosperms to early angiosperms. Good, and then um, as far as animals go, you went from early reptiles to early mammals. early mammals, and in the Cenozoic era was the age of mammals, and all the way from angiosperms to herbs, okay? Yes, molecular clock, what do we measure when we are looking at our molecular rate of mutations, good. Um, Geologic time scale, primates, major extinctions allow for adaptations, continental drift, right, explains, remember, biogeographical evolution, why we see changes later, like the diversity of mammals, because the continents are separated, mass extinctions. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. One big idea down. Yeah. Here you go. Awesome sauce. Boy, we really, if we need to, on a some later date, we can re-hit the end of that. You're super smart. Have a piece of toast. I am.